Hi, my name is Alice Antonelli, and I will be leading this session on understanding the mission money matrix. I've been working at NFF since 2002. I first got my start lending on the financial services team and have been a member of our consulting team at NFF since 2005. In these latter years, I've served to coach and support organizational leaders across the country in strengthening their financial capacity. I bring the lens of finance from my previous work experience in banking, specifically community development banking in New York City. I'm blessed to have worked with clients that inspire me with their tireless work to make a, the world a better place and wonderful colleagues that work with a very collaborative spirit. Even though you are viewing this recording virtually, each of us sits on a particular parcel of land and it's important to acknowledge the history of the land and its people. By acknowledging that history, we hope to widen the lens beyond the current moment and situate this conversation as a part of a much larger movement towards equity that we as individuals and organizations are a part of. So I join you all from Philadelphia, the home of the Lenny Lenape people, an indigenous people of the Northeastern woodlands who live in the United States and Canada. I invite you to look up the indigenous territory where you live or where you are watching this from today. If you don't know the territory, you can type in the link on the screen into your search engine. The link is https colon backslash backslash native dash land dot ca backslash. At NFF, we are seeking to include voices that were previously excluded. I hope this acknowledgement continues to build and expand our understanding of our world. I believe in the sovereign rights of the native communities in the Philadelphia area and throughout the world as they continue to be powerful stewards of this earth. So before we begin our session, let's just do three collective breaths together to move us forward. I understand that you may have joined us <clears throat> in some of our previous webinars or recordings. So I'm just gonna briefly share that Nonprofit Finance Fund is a 41-year-old nonprofit community development financial institution. We strive to support community-centered organizations led by people of color to gain control of their financial resources and knowledge that they need to make their community's aspirations a reality. We do this through lending to other nonprofits, as an investor, consulting to nonprofit leaders as a trusted partner, and maybe a financial educator, and using the insights we gain from the field to advocate for the communities that we serve. If you have been with us on this recorded webinar series, then you have learned about such topics as financial planning, cash flow projections, and strategic budgeting. In this session, we will be discussing a different type of analysis that brings together the mission impact of our programs with their respective economics. As it states on the slide, we will learn about how to analyze programs in terms of both mission alignment and economic impact. We will introduce the mission money matrix in order to facilitate this analysis. And lastly, we will use an example that draws on the specific mission data and program financial information that can be used for further discussion and conversation. All right, let's get started. In order to make informed decisions, we must understand how our programs contribute both to mission and financial objectives. So is there a tool or tools that we can use to help us gain this understanding? 
Yes, yes, there is. It's the mission money matrix, and that can help us. So what is behind the concept of the mission money matrix? It provides a, comp a comparison of programs in terms of scale or how big they are, mission alignment, and the financial contribution to the bottom line. It creates a visual representation of programmatic and financial data, which is really important, especially for those who are less well-versed in finance. And the tool should make the conversation accessible to a wider audience. It also combines both mission data and financial data in one easy to read chart. So what is the mission money matrix in more concrete terms? Well, it's a simple two by two grid that is intended to help facilitate a discussion about the financial contribution and mission alignment of each of your programs. We use it to understand how each of an organization's programs contributes to the mission and also how it contributes to, to the organization's bottom line. So let's take a look and see what it looks like. The first part of this analysis involves a framework like the one that you see on the screen. In this framework, we have along the bottom mission and money along the vertical axis. So let's walk through this. In the upper right-hand corner are the clear winners. They are aligned with mission and they generate a net surplus. That means that the revenue that the program generates exceeds direct expenses. Some questions that you might ask might be, what can we cultivate and how can we preserve these programs? Are there opportunities for growth or replication? Let me tell you that this is actually pretty rare. We are nonprofits for a reason. Most of our mission related programs cannot generate sufficient funds to cover direct expenses. So let's now move to the lower right hand quadrant which represents programs that are closely linked to mission, but that need to be financially sustained by other areas of the organization. This is actually far more typical. And questions here might be, is there a potential to cut direct costs? Can the revenue model be tweaked or changed to generate additional revenue for these programs? Does subsidy exist elsewhere in the organization to support these programs? All right, let's look at the upper left-hand square, which shows programs that have high financial contribution, but low mission alignment. As an example, a school for the blind that also runs a thrift store. The thrift store is really not related to the mission, but it does provide a surplus that the organization can use to subsidize other programs. Questions to ask here might be, is there an opportunity to align more with core programming? So for instance, could we incorporate a workforce development aspect into the thrift store business? The last square on our grid, shows low contribution, low mission alignment. This is an area that might require a little soul searching. Most organizations don't choose to operate programs that do not relate to the mission. Some though experience mission creep where you might run a couple of programs that relate somewhat to the mission for a few years and those programs may spawn others that relate just a little bit less. Questions to ask here might be, what is the current relevance of this program to the organization? Is this a legacy program or is it just a one-time program? Are there opportunities for strategic realignment? Can we make more money in this program? This is a simple two by two grid and it can enable a discussion about the relative trade-offs between financial contribution and mission alignment. It's helpful to think about how the role each of our programs plays in the larger context. 
Some programs will be valuable because of their high mission alignment. Other programs may be crucial because of their high net financial contribution. So question, have you ever used a mission money matrix tool or something like it? So let's take some time to think through some questions. What if you were to undertake a mission money matrix? So what questions would you like to answer? Is the data readily available to answer that question or questions? And will the analysis be useful? While you're thinking about your answer, let me continue. We will be using an example as we walk through this tool. So let's look at these questions through the eyes of Jordan Johnson, who is the fictitious executive director of Help for Homeless Youth or HHY. When we first started working with Help for Homeless Youth, we asked these three questions. The answer to the first question was that Jordan had received bad news and HHY was now projecting a deficit by year end. So she wanted to address that issue. To understand the dynamics of what was impacting HHY's profitability or lack thereof, we suggested that Jordan could conduct a mission money matrix in order to look at the mission fit of current and future programs in addition to the economics of those programs. So the answer to question number two, Jordan believed that she indeed did have the data for most of her programs. And finally, yes, she believed this analysis would be useful, especially in terms of facilitating a robust discussion with both board and staff. You may also reflect on different issues that may have arisen in the past or that you may be struggling with currently. Closures relating to COVID-19 come to mind. You may want to re-examine all of your programs, not only to look at the profitability, but also re-examine the mission fit going forward under different scenarios. So let's take a look at the mission money, or sorry, the mission part of the equation. How do we get started? First, we want to build out the program architecture. We will want to separate the programs from capacity. And what do I mean by capacity? Well, capacity could be administration, development, facility, and or IT or information technology. So these are Help for Homeless Youth's core program areas. First is on-site services. This is Help for Homeless Youth's oldest program. The organization began as an on-site provider of food and clothing and grew into a space where homeless youth could gather for recreation activities as well. Next is the mentorship program. Mentorship has been a big area of growth for HHY as it has garnered a lot of support from the local school system. Job counseling and readiness is the next program. And it only started about five years ago, but now has become Help for Homeless Youth's largest program. And lastly, partner services. This is a program where HHY partners with other service providers to provide access to quality health and dental care. Notice that on the capacity side or the non-program side, we separated out development activities from administrative. Next, we will want to send out a survey to ask questions about different aspects of each program. So who will you survey? Stakeholders can and have included staff, board, organizational partners or collaborators, advisors, and even program participants. The survey should go to a representative sample and the sample size should be at least greater than three. Remember, 
anyone you ask to take the survey is going to want to know why. So it's important to give context. For example, you may use this tool for strategic planning purposes, decision-making, or as a part of an organizational assessment. Next, we need to develop the survey. To understand how programs relate to mission, we use the survey to learn more about the mission impact or alignment of each of our programs. Note that we're not talking about impact as it relates to program outcomes. We're using the term impact a little bit more broadly. Notice the form or the spreadsheet on the bottom of the slide. This is given to each staff, board member, and others that you have identified to take the survey, and they will rate the program based on each of the questions asked. This questionnaire can be completed on Zoomerang, Fluid Survey, SurveyMonkey, Google Forms, or even email. On this slide, we have some sample questions for you. First, alignment with core mission. Ask your group to rate how well the programs address and achieve core mission. Next on our list, implementation of programs. Ask them to rate how well the program or the organization implements each program. For example, they can reflect on program evaluation data or constituent feedback. Number three on our list, does the program currently reach the maximum number of participants? Ask the respondents to consider the number of people or communities impacted by the program as it currently exists. For example, if the program worked with 30 youth, it would score higher than a program that just worked with five. Note, just because someone might rate a program as a one, or low on the scale, does not mean that we're relieving ourselves of that program. <clears throat> this is about gathering information and not decision-making at the moment. Though we are hoping that it will facilitate those hard conversations, but let's hold that for later. On this slide, we have some more sample questions for you. Cultivation. To what extent does the activity lead participants to other programs within the organization and thus increase the overall impact? Does the program provide a service that is not readily available in or affordable anywhere else in the community? How important is the program to contributors or donors? To what extent does the particular activity motivate funders and donors to contribute resources to the program. Can you customize your questions that are relevant to your organization and situation? Of course you can. These are just examples. Average ratings uh, for the questions gives us one of the two data points that we need to visualize the mission in money impact of each of the programs. So this is an example of one person's rating using one to five scoring. Notice that the raw ratings are up above and the weighted averages are below. Note the weightings in the middle of the spreadsheet. You can weight which response you want to have more of an impact on the scoring. So there's a little customization there. Let's look at the total weighted average scores at the right. Looks like for this person, on-site services ranks the highest with a 4.1, then job counseling at 3.9 and so on, with mentorship ranking the lowest at 3.1. Now let's explore the money part. Let's dive into the financial methodology or the money part of the matrix. First, we typically start with an annual budget, a forecast, or another forward-looking projection. 
Then we identify and assign all revenue and expenses that are directly tied to each program. All other supporting expenses like management, occupancy, fundraising, and IT are examined separately. By doing this type of an analysis, we can see which programs generate surplus and deficits, thereby understanding the direct effect the program has on the organization's bottom line. Remember this chart? Now we are going to input these program areas into the spreadsheet. This is our program economic analysis worksheet. We put the program areas in up at the top and the numbers go in the middle. Revenue is going to be near the top and expenses listed underneath. So this slide shows the tool after Jordan entered in all of her numbers. So let's continue with the architecture. On the top of the spreadsheet, you can see all of her programs, on-site services, mentorship, job counseling and readiness, partner services, and we actually added a column in for program management that you might want to consider. The revenue and expenses here are the direct activities associated with the program areas. So if a program were to go away, the associated revenue and expense would go away as well. So for example, if Jordan had a major funder that was discontinuing funding, say in the partner services area, and she could, she may decide that she could no longer continue this program and the salaries and other direct expenses could no longer get paid and they would go away. On the right, we have capacity. And you might think of this as the administrative lines of the business. The revenue and expenses here in capacity are the indirect activities associated with what it takes just to open the doors, turn on the lights before you produce one unit of service or programming. You can also think of it as, as the revenue and expenses that will not leave your organization even if your programs change, grow, or get discontinue. So for example, Jordan's salary, even if she wears many programmatic hats, will not go away if one of those programs alters or goes away. So her salary is listed under administrative, her total salary. Let's specifically walk through on-site services. At the top, we have revenue in the form of a specific $65,000 grant from a foundation for this program. Next is $15,000 in in-kind expense support. This represents donated materials, for instance, supplies and clothing for the youth. Note that all these revenue sources are very specific to on-site services and not any other program, nor do they represent general operating support. Next, we have expenses in the form of personnel, and this represents a program manager, and support, which represents supplies, materials, and communication in particular. All right, let's take a step back. The numbers that we will specifically need to complete our analysis are the surplus deficit numbers for each program, and the size of each program budget. Now let's pull it all together. As a reminder, we have mission along the bottom axis and money along the vertical axis. Programs with strong mission alignment would sit over on the right and those with lower mission alignment would be closer to the left. Similarly, along the vertical axis, programs that generate the largest margins are towards the top, whereas 
programs that run deficits or require subsidy are on the bottom. Lastly, the size of each circle represents the budget size of each program. So this is the output for Help for Homeless Youth. When you combine the two parts of this analysis, the numbers from the program economic spreadsheet and the mission impact survey to inform the mission piece, you can create a graph that looks like this. Notice the four quadrants with mission on the horizontal axis and margin or profitability on the vertical axis. Remember, the size of the circle equals the budget size of the program. The larger the circle, the bigger the budget size. As you move up and down the chart, you get a sense of profitability. And moving along left to right is mission alignment with mission, more mission aligned programs on the right. So let's take a few moments to sit with this picture and come up with a few observations. The first is that some programs, not all, have positive mission alignment according to the surveys. Second, two of the programs generate a surplus and the other two are deficit producing. There are some interesting conversations that you could have based on this information, even without a detailed understanding of the organization. For instance, is there a way to improve the economics of the on-site services program since it is so close to generating a positive economic benefit to the organization? On-site services is that yellow circle in the lower right-hand quadrant. It has strong mission alignment, as you can see. So what might be some ideas? Well, we could see if we could garner additional funding specifically for that program. And we might also want to dig into the export, support expenses to examine what all is in there. Now, on the other side of the chart is partner services. It's not only the smallest program in blue, the blue circle, produces a deficit, but it seems that many do not believe that it is all that mission aligned. If they were to discontinue this program, would it free up other resources or free up time for Jordan to pursue some more strategic opportunities? Using this visualization of your organization's budget can help to spark deeper conversation about where there are areas for improvement or change. Note, this graph is an aggregate look at all survey answers from all participants weighted accordingly. But you could break this down by question if you wanted to and have a chart representing each of those survey questions. Now, let's overlay the circles on our picture here just to see what it looks like. I think there's an opportunity today for you to focus on what you do well and to structure yourself to support those activities. Doing more with less is not sustainable, particularly in this economic environment. We need as leaders to give ourselves permission to do less with less. It's okay. So from here, let's revisit our programs and mission. What's core to your mission? Which activities are the positive financial contributors, which need subsidy or need to be covered financially from another source or sources in your organization? As you are asking yourself some tough questions and begin to identify options, it's important to keep in mind what is core or non-negotiable when you consider both present and the future what you must do, this is mission central, what you should do, surplus generating, and what you wanna do, 
maybe there's a new program area that requires subsidy and you wanna set it up for the future. In an ideal world, any priority activity would also be net, a net positive contributor to your bottom line. But if they are not, that just means that they, those programs or the new activities need to be supported by something else in your budget, financially supported. Some organizations may want to ask themselves, what will we look like a year from now as a changed and potentially smaller organization? The key to answering this question is identifying what is core to your mission and determining whether we can support it either alone or maybe in partnership with others. We can apply this information to decisions about which programs to grow, to trim, or eliminate in the context of financial, mission, and other organizational considerations. This information can inform you how to prioritize programs. Are there any clear winners or clear distractions? but also how to narrow in on activities that deserve more of management's attention on both the revenue and the cost side and mission. All right, let's take a little time to reflect on what we've heard today. How can the mission money matrix help you going forward? How can it highlight program metrics in a way that allows you to have a transparent conversation about your programs with your board, your staff, or other network or community members? Let's revisit the goals that we set out at the beginning of this session. I hope you learned about how to analyze programs in terms of both mission alignment and economic impact. Number two, in order to understand how to do this analysis, we introduced the mission money matrix. And lastly, we used an example to examine mission data and program financial information to be used for further conversation and discussion. The next session, if you're tracking the series in order, will be on managing risk and opportunity, one of my favorite topics. The session will be taught by Mr. Johnny Lumbor. As it says on the screen, nonprofit leaders are most adaptable when they understand their organization's financial risks and resources required to manage them. Johnny will cover how an organization's capital structure supports financial resilience and how to strengthen capital structure during times of uncertainty. He will also introduce the concept of full cost, a concept that we will explore in greater detail in that next session. So that's it for this session. Thank you so much for li listening and I wish you the best of luck in your future. Bye for now.